that's for all those black children, black workers. Uh, I write there frequently uh, on a lot of things, but on some topics dealing with socialism and the history of socialism. I became a socialist, uh, joining a socialist organization in 1969, and had been continuously involved in that organization with successors. A couple of years ago, I joined the Democratic Socialists of America, and uh, I, I think it was a uh, Hi, I'm Calvin Priest. I'm from Seattle. I'm a member of Socialist Alternative also. Um, I'm uh, the uh, editor of Socialist Alternative's website, socialistalternative.org, and also on the editorial board. And I was uh, Chum Salon's campaign manager for re-election campaign in 2015. My name is Ryan Mossro. I am a, Metro, a member of Metro DC DSA, uh, also a member of Washington Baltimore New Skill, local uh, CWA of 32035. Um, been a socialist for the last 10 years, involved in lots of different campaigns, and I'm currently the uh, national campus organizer for Young Democratic Socialists of America. Uh, thank you all for attending our workshop. I'm very happy to be here. So let's go into our introductory comments, and I'll start, and we'll just go down the line. So am I starting? Oh, I'll start. Sorry. Oh, you're starting. Yes, sorry. Well, good night. You're also a speaker. Yes, yes, I am moderating and speaking. Okay, <laughs> Busy afternoon. All right. Um, so when we look at the current political and social climate of our country, of our world, we see the signs of a system in crisis. While we're told that the economy is in recovery, we see stagnant wages that have not kept up with the cost of living, dead-end jobs that offer little financial security, and crushing debt that is almost impossible to keep up with. While our larger society has grown more diverse and more tolerant of the different identities we hold, we're also seeing a rise in violent, racist, right-wing populism. Millions of people are burdened with expensive health insurance that is inadequate, or they simply go uninsured using uh, emergency rooms to get their health care. Superstorms, heat waves, wildfires, and other environmental events grow more and more extreme every year while we continue to burn the earth with fossil fuels and hazardous waste. Capitalism is in crisis, and the working class and the youth know it. As a young person, I see the empty promises of capitalism in the everyday conditions of my life. I was led to believe that if I went to this school and got a couple of degrees and a nice white colored job, that I would be rewarded um, for my hard work with uh, financial security, full benefits, stable housing, and growing wages. Instead, I find myself in over $100,000 in student loan debt, barely enough savings to survive on for more than two months, relying on cheap group, group housing in order to afford rent, and face an all around uncertain future. And I'm sure many of you, particular, particularly the young people in the crowd, face similar circumstances. I now understand that the narrative of the middle class that's repeated in our society is an illusion. There are truly only two economic classes in our world, the working class, which produces all of society's wealth, vast wealth, and the 1% or capitalist class, the few people in our world who take the vast majority of the wealth created by the working class for themselves. And my white collar job doesn't separate me from the working class, because if you have to sell your labor on the market in order to live, then you're a part of the working class, whether you're a well-paid engineer, or a low-paid dishwasher. Capitalism is rooted in the exploitation of the working class. Big business, whose only motive is to maximize profits, is fundamentally at odds with the interests of working people and the environment. Racism, sexism, and environmental destruction are tools that the capitalist class uses in order to ensure ever-increasing profits, regardless of the cost to humanity and the natural world. Now, over the last few decades, Americans have been fed this ideology of neoliberalism, that citizens are consumers whose democratic choices are best exercised by buying and selling on the market. Merit is rewarded and inefficiency is punished, and any limits to competition is a limitation on liberty. We've seen tax regulation minimized to favor the rich, public services increasingly privatized, and the power of labor unions almost completely eliminated, while austerity is pushed on the masses, Inequality is seen as a matter of virtue. You're poor, it's your fault. You didn't make the right decisions. You don't use your money wisely. You make poor lifestyle choices. Neoliberalism tells us that the market ensures that everyone gets what they deserve. 
But more and more young people are coming to understand that that narrative is also an illusion. And as we contend with the Trump administration's ceaseless attacks on women, people of color, immigrants, queer people, and other oppressed groups, young people are searching for answers on how we fight the right and win justice for all working people. But in order to fight capitalism and win, uh, create a winning strategy, we need to understand how it works to oppress us and keep us divided. Two examples would be health care and the climate. In the case of health care, the United States has the highest health care costs of any industrialized nations, and yet some of the worst health care outcomes. Neoliberalism would have us believe that poor health is a consequence of freely choosing individuals, making poor lifestyle choices, and therefore those individuals should be responsible for paying for their own health care. But in reality, our health care is so expensive and inefficient because of a poor profit system that is fundamentally at odds with its customers. People need comprehensive health care, and health insurance companies need profit. So the more health care we need, the less in profits they make. This never-ending quest for profit virtually ensures that health care will always be expensive and therefore mostly inaccessible to large portions of the working class. In the case of the environment, neoliberalism tells us that we should recycle, buy green, return to a simpler way of living, and adjust our lifestyles and our technology to adapt to the changing climate. But in reality, capitalism demands that the most financially inexpensive and expedient methods of waste disposal, controlling pests, and producing energy be used in order to create more and more profit, regardless of the catastrophic cost to the natural world. Destructive and environmentally dangerous energy production, such as fossil fuels and nuclear power, are used in place of safer, greener methods of energy development because it's seen as too expensive to utilize. On top of this, attempts by regulatory agencies to control the abuses to our environment are seen as a barrier to development and are many times co-opted by politicians who are heavily influenced by corporate donorship of the most polluted companies. Under capitalism, goods and services are produced for the sole purpose of making profit, and everything else takes a backseat to this motive. So as long as environmental destruction is financially expedient, we will continue to see the devastating consequences of climate change with no end. And compounding the problem is the fact that the working class does not have the power to make production decisions. These are made by the capitalist class. So how do we fight capitalism? How do we gain justice for oppressed groups, particularly in a time when so many people are looking for answers? Well, as I've outlined, the root of the world's deepest problems is capitalism, and so the solution must be the rejection of capitalism and in its place, a democratic socialism in which working people own and manage the means of production. Democratic socialism seeks to bring a real human connection to our economy by facilitating uh, economic and social order based on human need and freeing us from the author authoritarian features of capitalism. Socialist Alternative consistently works to build a revolutionary party of the working class that would take the top 500 corporations into public ownership under democratic control so that we can end the capitalist class's grip on uh, power over us. We need a single-payer Medicare for All alternative to our parasitic health care system. And ultimately, we call for bringing the hospital and pharmaceutical industries into democratic public ownership. It's not irresponsible lifestyle choices or inefficient nurses and doctors that are responsible for our broken health care system. It's capitalism. And changes in our lifestyle or market-based reforms like the Affordable Health Care Act can't fix our health care healthcare system. Only socialism can. It's not human civilization itself or individual consumption patterns that are to blame for climate change and environmental destruction. It's the capitalist mode of production. And changing what we eat or how we transport, or transport ourselves or what we buy can't undo or mediate the catastrophic changes in our climate. It's socialist policies that bring the polluting energy industries into democratic public ownership and tool them for renewable energy. Socialists see the global working class as the key force to changing the world. We build everything, we make everything, we transport everything, we provide all the services, teach all the kids, operate the cash registers, clean the floors, fix the computers, cook and serve food, tend to the sick. We do everything that makes the system run. And if we're sufficiently well organized, we can use our collective power to end this bankrupt system once and for all and to fundamentally transform to a democratic socialist society.
Well, I agree. Uh, uh, I can agree with Sarko's talk. Uh, but so let me do something else. Uh, and I'm also saying that I learned I was doing this a little bit ago. Uh, I think that I'm a historian, so let me talk a little bit about the history of socialism. Uh, and I think I have a view of it. I know there's a number of socialist alternative members here. Uh, some of you I've met before. Some of you I'm meeting now. And I, I probably have a somewhat different take on socialism. And, for those people who don't, you know, are coming out of some other part of the Bernie movement, you might have a, uh, find this interesting as uh, an introduction if you're not familiar with it. So, you know, socialism, I think, is the dream of human beings almost from the beginning of class societies. That is, in every society, in every religion, in every, um, uh, in every myth, we find the idea of the place where human beings will come together and live in abundance and peace. It is a deep desire that comes out of class society and comes out of the history of warfare and so on. Uh, that idea is found in countless rebellions by people in uh, religious movements, usually, led by religious leaders in many different societies, who rebel against the existing uh, institution, whatever, that, uh, in Europe it's a church, and they say no, you know, if they're Christians, they say no, but if we're all children of God, then why don't we share everything? And so the answer is communism in all of these rebellions. The answer is let's share everything, let's live together in love and peace and abundance. So it's a very uh, old idea. And then also we have, uh, by the 18th century, with the rise of industrial capitalism, the strengthening of the bourgeois state, we have the rise of a group of thinkers who looking around at what's happening, the strengthening of states, more armed men, uh, the growth of industrial capitalism, machines, pollution. We have people like Charles Fourier, the great French utopian socialist, very concerned with the environment, by the way. And Fourier looks out at, at the world and says, why can't we build, why can't we resolve the differences of social classes? Why can't we overcome them? Why can't we bridge country and city? And he and many others uh, Etienne Cabet and so on. There's a whole list of particularly of French utopian socialists. But they have the idea of creating a society we could all uh, live together in peace and love and harmony and, and in a peaceful world, a prosperous world. Uh, Marx comes into this world, Karl Marx, German philosopher, uh, going to college, college guy, hanging out in bars, drinking, studying philosophy. And uh, Marx comes along and says, you know, um, he starts to look around the world. He says, there's a new thing here. There's a new thing here happening, and it seems to be the working class, and that the working class might be the vehicle of this eternal human dream for peace, love, happiness, fulfillment, etc., and that the working class um, uh, could change society. That the working class, he says, is the class with radical change, uh, radical chains, the class with radical change, the class with it, which, if it frees itself, frees humanity. The great uh, idealistic idea that the working class has this view uh, of changing humanity. And so this, and he says this at a time, as you know, this revolution breaks out in Europe uh, of 1848. And in that revolution, um, there's a, actually, in most of Europe, it's a struggle for, uh, against feudalism. But in France, where there's already been a French revolution in 1789, it becomes a struggle not only to restore the democratic revolution, but also for socialism. So we have the first struggle for socialism in June of 1848. And, uh, but there isn't just two classes. That is, in that struggle for socialism, there's also, there's a large petty bourgeoisie, people who are not big capitalists, not the 1%, but are not part of the working class. There's also a lumpen proletariat that can be hired as thugs to beat up, as uh, gangs to beat up the workers. And it, so it's in that world that socialism arises, in a world of plural classes, multiple classes. I think that's still our challenge. That is, there's a, you know, there's a huge petty bourgeoisie in America. Uh, people who own small businesses, people who have uh, uh, large uh, incomes from investments and so on, but are not part of the one percent. So this is a this is a multi-class struggle. And there's also many people who fall out of the bottom of the working class, and some of them fall into uh, lives of terrible desperation, who would do anything to survive. So. Um, uh, 
So, so they, we have this, this revolutionary movement in Europe. France is sort of seems the home of the revolution, doesn't it? In Europe, 1789, 1848, 1871, the Paris Commune. Uh, there's a war between France and Germany. Uh, the Germans are marching in. The French bourgeoisie says, let's get out of here. And they flee to Versailles. And when they flee the city, the workers of Paris have to run the city themselves. And they say, we will run this city ourselves democratically. And they elect people from the neighborhoods. They create a neighborhood democratic councils. They create the first council workers government of Paris. It only lasts a few months. Um, and it is crushed when the bourgeoisie gets its army and comes back to Paris and marches them out and executes tens of thousands of them against a wall. But we have the first attempt at a socialist revolution. Then we had an allusion earlier today to the revolution in 1917. Uh, I should stop here a moment, because in Germany, Socialism has success. People organize socialist unions. The socialist party grows. It goes into parliament, but it lies with the, with the liberals. That is, in parliament, it's hard for the socialist party not to stand with the liberals against Bismarck, the Junkers, the conservatives, and so on. So having a big socialist party, getting elected to parliament, doesn't necessarily solve your problems. When World War I breaks out, uh, what happens is that uh, the socialist parties of Europe collapse except for in a few places. So in Russia, Bulgaria, Italy, and the United States are the only places that the socialist parties come out against the war. All the other socialist parties, the German and the French being the most important, go off to war. But the, so there's a revolution in Russia. In Russia, because of the desperation of the war, the oppression of the Tsar, the, the growth of industry there, there is an uprising by workers and peasants, a democratic movement from below that overthrows the government and establishes uh, a new kind of power. This revolution is led by one of the Russian socialist parties, by a faction of it called the Bolshevik Party. And it comes to power out of that working class and takes power in Russia and holds power, I would say, for a few years. And I would say, almost from the beginning, it's almost impossible to hold power. And I have one minute, and I'm just getting started. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so, but I think it's important to get to this point. Let me take this one minute for this. That is. I agree with what was said yesterday, that that socialist revolution uh, was, a, was perhaps the greatest event in human history, in a way. That is, it is the event that showed the possibility of workers and peasants to take power. But because of the circumstances of that revolution, within a few years, that is gone. Uh, the Bolsheviks attempt to rule, but the power is eroded from beneath them, and there is no, there is no possibility uh, for them to continue to hold power. And what happens is that the party says, we'll hold power on behalf of the workers, but you can't hold power on behalf of the workers. The minute you start to do that, you're dead. Your socialism is dead. And certainly, by 1929, socialism is gone. A new class has come to power. The people who are the communist bureaucracy have come to power. And they now run an exploitative state, an imperialist state. This is, and that has been, we say, what is democratic socialism? I think we want to say it's neither that socialism that won power in parliament, nor is it that communism that came out of Stalinism and that bureaucracy. It has to be something we build anew from below that is democratic and comes out of a partici mass participation of workers. And, uh, and that should give us something to think about. Thank you. 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 I thought the organizers of the event thought it was important to have this workshop, to have a discussion about capitalism and socialism. From what I've seen, all the panels I've, I've watched, all of them have had a discussion about capitalism and socialism. But I think there is this growing recognition. It was cited in one of the earlier discussions that people under 30 now see uh, socialism more favorably than capitalism. Um, and that's really important. Um, but I think at the same time, we have to recognize that there's not yet a mass consciousness around socialism, what socialism means, and also, of course, this is I mean, it's already been reflected this weekend as well, is that it means different things to different people. Uh, the term democratic socialism also means different things to different people. And so I think we have to, I mean, we're, we're reaching, a, a, I think, a, a point uh, in the discussion where we have to talk a bit more about what we mean by that and, uh, uh, and also look at some of these lessons from the past, uh, because I think that is one of the important important things that the socialist movement has to bring to, to our movements and to our struggles uh, is uh, to, to, uh, to bring uh, some of those lessons from the, 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 the past, uh, uh, past working class movements and revolutions. 
And there are a lot of starting points for this discussion, and I, I mean, I think Sarko, uh, I agree, I think climate is, a, is an excellent starting point. I mean, of course, it's, right, it's a horrifying backdrop, backdrop to this conference this weekend uh, with uh, Hurricane Irma barreling toward Florida after having wiped out 90% of the structures in several islands in the Caribbean, uh, already killed 25 people, uh, and uh, lots I've heard is still a Category 5 storm which is expected to reach huge damage or to wreak huge damage in uh, the Florida Keys and maybe other other uh, uh, other parts of the states and uh, and so um, I think that, so the question I mean it's a serious question can this system be reformed and uh, um, and Dan talked about how the idea of a of a fundamentally different kind of society is an old idea and I think that's true and uh, but I would say also the idea of of we have to reform the system that's in place. Uh, it's also an old idea uh, that uh, whatever every system, every social system that has ever existed has had uh, defenders who have said, well, this system sucks in a lot of ways, uh, but it's the best system that we're, we can really have. And, uh, and so we got to fix it. We got to make it a bit better, but we can't have a fundamentally different kind of system. You know, and uh, that was also, I mean, it was also said of, of, of slavery. Uh, that, uh, that, uh, that slavery has always existed and uh, it will always exist and therefore what we, and liberals of, the, of that era argued, uh, I'm not calling anybody a liberal in this room, but liberals of that era argued that, uh, um, that well, uh, we need a kind of gentleman form of slavery um, and, uh, or we need to phase slavery out. And of course, slavery wasn't phased out. Slavery was ended through what was essentially the second American Revolution. And uh, actually, Marx is at that time, and Marx himself, are, uh, they actually they backed Abraham Lincoln, the Republican Party, not because they had illusions that, uh, that Lincoln was you know, really uh, strongly an abolitionist, or that he, uh, you know, certainly that he was anti-capitalist in any sense, but they backed him because they saw the significance of, uh, of, of what uh, uh, he represented, what the Republican Party represented, uh, and that it could shape the American system to its foundations and destroy the system of slavery. Uh, of course, while slavery was destroyed, uh, Jim Crow came out of it, and of course we still have, you know, um, uh, a horrifying a system of institutional racism today. But nonetheless, uh, that uh, that massive change had a, had a fundamental effect on uh, uh, ordinary people, on black people uh, in the U.S., and also it had an, an impact internationally. And uh, and so. We have to look, I think we have to look at, you know, what are, can this system be reformed? I think that's an important question for us to get into. Um, I, don't, I don't think that capitalism can. I think that fundamentally capitalism is a system that has, that has massive inequality, it has uh, climate destruction, uh, it has racism and sexism and homophobia built into its foundations, that the, uh, the, the, the need for the ruling class, uh, for the very wealthy, for the billionaires, to defend their system, it requires them to divide our ordinary people and to pick them against each other. And, uh, and so it's a system that creates a, a, a bigotry of all forms and, and sexism. And it also is a system that's incapable of actually carrying out the project that's needed right now in terms of the environment, which is uh, uh, a, a massive transformation of the, way the, of the way that economy functions, an end to the use of fossil fuels, a rapid transition towards renewable energy, and there are many other aspects of it as well. Uh, and that actually, I think, requires the democratic planning of, of the energy uh, sector and, and, the, and the big corporations, actually, for the working class to actually uh, make uh, 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 a conscious, to develop a conscious plan of how we're going to end renewable energy, because we are end, uh, end uh, climate crisis. Because uh, the, the problem is, is that is that if we just uh, sort of tweak capitalism around the edges, uh, the planet actually uh, will be, you know, and I think somebody said yesterday, it's true, human civilization is at risk, the planet will survive. But human civilization is very much at risk, and there are, of course, some horrifying scenarios that are possible even in the next 100 years uh, if, uh, if there isn't uh, real action taken. And, uh, and I don't think that capitalism is, uh, has it in its, uh, it's capable of doing that. And so, yes, it's a difficult project, it is a difficult project to get rid of capitalism and build a new kind of society, but I think it's a necessary step 
And I think if we, if we don't succeed in doing that, uh, climate change actually will uh, have uh, a uh, uh, will uh, have an enormously devastating impact on human society. Um, but on top of that, it's uh, I, this was also referenced I think uh, last night uh, what, that you know we we see just you know uh, unbelievable uh, growth in inequality. Uh, that, that two years ago, the, the, uh, Oxfam found that 62 people own more wealth than half the world's population. Uh, and, and now, earlier this year, it's now six. Now it's six billionaires that own more wealth than half the world's population. And reflected in that, actually, is enormous suffering for ordinary people. Enormous suffering in terms of their own conditions and their access to health care. And so, I think there's a, and I just want to use, just, and this, I think this is going to be a, a, a lot, there's going to be a lot more to discuss here, but I just want to talk about a more recent example, and I, want to, I think it's, the Russian Revolution is a really important example to talk about, but a more recent example of the question of, of uh, reform uh, versus revolution, and, and the, the ability, the idea, having a, a good intention to try to, to, to change the system from within, uh, versus recognizing that we need a more fundamental change, and that's Greece. And uh, there's, not a, there's not as much awareness, I think, of, of what happened in the Greece over the last couple of years. I don't really have time to get into it right now, and I'll come back to it. But, uh, but uh, a, a coalition party of the left, uh, most members of which saw themselves as socialists, identified as socialists, called Syriza, uh, came to power. And they came to power, they came to power saying that they were going to end brutal austerity. You know, the Greek people have been through a horrifying social crisis over the past several years. Uh, and austerity has hit hardest there. And the, and the reality of that has been uh, uh, massive unemployment, 50% uh, of young people being unemployed at times during this crisis, uh, uh, elderly people losing their pensions, uh, and lack of access to basic services, and alongside that, the threat of the far right, uh, growing uh, uh, far right uh, in the form of a party called Golden Dawn, which is, by the way, the alternative to the left doesn't provide an alternative. That's what we're seeing also of course, in the United States in a different way. But if the left doesn't provide a real alternative that actually can solve these fundamental questions, and, uh, and we go down the path that Syriza went down, where they, where they, called, where they said they were going to end austerity, but because ending austerity meant that they had to go up against the, the power of the capitalist class and the power of the European institutions, who actually, they, they, they own the wealth. And so, we, and so Cyprus, the leader of Syriza, and other leaders of Syriza said, we're just going to bargain better than the rest of them did. We're going to bargain better. We're going to win uh, some. We're going to win some real improvements. And this, the uh, Troika said, "Well, no, we own you, and you're not going to." And so that's where we're. I think where this discussion is at. How do we actually come, confront the fact that under capitalism, the power is not in our hands, and we can't control what we don't own? Well, I think not. Not surprisingly, um, the. The people on this panel probably have going on at the same points because you know the question of capitalism and socialism, you know, as has been said, has been facing us very squarely, one because of obviously economic changes and political changes, um, based on you know the 2016 election where we saw you know the Democratic Socialist like Bernie Sanders and um, an unnatural disaster like President Trump um, come to the White House, which spurred a lot of people to really ask these questions. And the question of what is democratic socialism is Really, a massive topic. <laughs> um, you know, we're getting into you know the, the traditional socialist critique of you know capitalism, and you know the case for socialism usually revolves around you know capitalism sucks and socialism is dope, so let's go for that. Um, but I think it's important as this as the remarks have already begun to illustrate that it's really important that we become very concrete, especially as the social movement is growing, especially as people are drawing socialist conclusions, you know, we see it just in the polls of the last five years, every poll that comes out about, you know, popularity of capitalism versus socialism, socialism is more and more favorable. Now, in fact, um, millennials, or, you know, by 51%, I think, in growing, uh, favor socialism to capitalism by a wide margin, which is, of course, reflected a lot, you know, concretely in the function of the it's a movement. Um, I think, you know, again, to discuss this issue concretely, I think, you know, obviously it's very present in our minds is um, the climate, climate crisis. Um, because you had, you know, we had Hurricane Harvey that made landfall just a few weeks ago. Um, by the standards, it was one of the largest storms to ever hit the continent of the United States um, in terms of actual water that was dropped. It was the largest. Um, now we had Hurricane Irma as well. Um, that is threatening Florida. I'm actually from Florida, 
there's a certain there's a criminal hell zone. Um, and you know, again, it, it, disasters like this pose, on the one hand, uh, an economic crisis, and they also pose a political crisis. Um, in terms of the political crisis, I noticed today that the uh, director of the EPA saw through it, uh, made a statement where he said, um, essentially, you know, now's not really the time to discuss climate change. You know, we should be focusing on matters at hand. Um, that it's you know disrespectful to the people there to be discussing this. Um, you know, and this is again a political crisis because you know really encapsulated in the presidency of Donald Trump, who once immediately once he came to office removed you know uh, language about climate change from the website, uh, completely you know uh, uninterested in really challenging it notoriously during the campaign. He said, or I think before the campaign, he said that climate change was an idea made up by China. Um, it's kind of not real. Um, you know, and, and it's because you know it's not it's it's part of the course of the Republican Party, of course. Um, they've been traditionally completely unwilling to address climate change because of, as the point of Congress has raised about how it affects business and things like this. But of course we shouldn't, you know, give a pass to the Democratic Party, which has also had a traditionally horrid approach to climate change. You know, President Obama was president for eight years. Um, he took essentially, you know, as, as Sarko illustrated, essentially a market-based, consumer-based approach, you know, in terms of policy, you know, things like cap and trade, which have been completely one completely, uh, you know, with far less than what we actually need to resolve the problem. But on the second hand, because they're so now minding that Trump came out and just like, well, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so it creates a, uh, these, these huge problems. So it creates a political crisis in terms of working people, you know, there is no force in society right now. There's no political uh, expression that is clear, that is are clearly articulating this issue of climate change, along with many, many other issues that the economists have raised around, you know, inequality, wages, and so on. Um, but it also poses a pretty stark economic crisis, you know. And again, these, these disasters, you know, when they come on to make landfall, they, they make the economic crisis in play very clear. You know, there was a notorious picture of Harvey made landfall of, you know, people in retirement homes who were up to their waist in water wading through. And this is because, you know, especially in the rural south where these, where these particular hurricanes are affecting, you know, South Sudan with Katrina, where, you know, you have uh, the Republican government there, as soon as Katrina happened, Harvey made landfall 12 years of the anniversary of Katrina. As soon as Katrina made landfall, um, you know, it devastated the infrastructure. The infrastructure was completely unwilling or completely unprepared to deal with this. Uh, just like we saw similar in Harvey, we'll probably see similar things in Florida, unfortunately. Um, and completely, you know, exacerbated. The economic crisis exacerbated this disaster at the same time when capitalism is literally fueling these economic disasters or these uh, climate disasters um, because they're completely unwilling to challenge how fundamental way that their economy functions. So. You know, it is absolutely appropriate. You know, these things kind of put it in stark contrast. What makes it even more stark, you know, from my position, is, you know, being from Florida particularly, you know, Florida is a place that could, you know, if, if even if you just had socialism, some kind of a socialist model in Florida, you know, it could completely revolutionize the whole economy. So the idea of not addressing climate no, change, not just climate change, is because, you know, they don't, we had consecutive governments for decades and decades in Florida, whether Republican or Democrat, who have been completely unwilling to address the way that uh, these communities there have been absolutely suffocated. You know, the way that, they, that, the, that capitalism is developed pretty much everywhere is it essentially becomes a transmission belt, bringing resources away from those communities, putting them to pockets of the business. And I actually spoke to my uh, brother recently, he lives in Florida, and I was talking to him, we were talking about the socialism. Um, and imagine that. And, uh, <laughs> and he said something to me like, you know, he's a work class, they are in Florida. He said something to me along the lines as well, you know, socialism, Probably work in New York, um, <laughs> uh, or maybe in LA, but in Florida, I don't think it would work. And again, like just if just in the in the nature of climate change, just if you look at that, and just in the state of Florida, Florida Florida could have an absolute green revolution if there was the political will and the economic. There was a political force, you know, nationally, of course, we wouldn't have socialism in the state. But if there was a political force that had um, a clear economic plan and political plan to make it a uh, actionable. It could have an absolute green revolution. Florida is poised that, you know, just because of the terrain, you know, solar energy, and tidal energy, geothermal energy, they could take absolute, you know, advantage of these things. Those things wouldn't alone be socialism. But, you know, if you have an economic model, which I would consider socialism an economic model where, you know, investment is there and everybody decided to control, um, if you have that kind of economic model reinforced by a political, political force that would be able to make it uh, uh, realizable, you could make that happen overnight. You know, if, the, if it's become a bore now to hear about how, <laughs> about how realizable socialism is on paper when you just simply look at the resources that are available and the massive, the amount of resources that are being 
developed globally uh, now is, you know, we could, you know, you see, you see stats on Facebook now about how it will only take like 35 million or 35 billion dollars like clean housing and educate everyone in the world. <laughs> you know, it's become so, so almost mundane um, to discuss these things. So it, it's, you know, again, just, just on the issue of climate change, capitalism is completely unwilling to deal with these things and socialism really is, is not just an alternative, it's an imperative. But I think that another point that the Congress have raised, I just want to, I just want to bring up, which is that, you know, like I said earlier, um, so a socialist, you know, approach, a socialist argument, you know, for against capitalism, for socialism, you know, with all those, you know, nuanced points, there's capitalism sucks, socialism is dope, let's fight for socialism. But there is a contradiction, and I think it's been kind of alluded to here, in the sense that that, that socialists, socialists historically, our movement historically, has struggled to square that circle come up with an idea, a clear concept of what that transition from capitalism to socialism would look like. And it's great, you know, been a, a, a group for a really great, excellent debate over history. Um, my feeling is, is that there isn't a clear template that we could just look at and just pick up a sort of and apply today um, that would that answer that question. I mean, it's, a, it's a hard question. It's a tough question to ask. And it requires, you know, discussions like this. It requires thought. It requires historical analysis. Um, I hope we can have more time to get into it. I want to respect the chair. Uh, so I'll wait for So the rest of the plan, yes, is uh, we have three questions that uh, all the panelists will answer. And you will have uh, three minutes or less to respond. And then after that, we'll open it up to the audience. Um, so the first question. Polls show that young people now view socialism more favorably than capitalism. Why do you think there is such a growing interest in socialism today? And what do you mean by socialism? So I'll start again. Uh, as shared and as a um, so, so just quickly, why are young people viewing socialism more favorably than capitalism? Well, I think it's a twofold answer. One, uh, we did not grow up in the era of the red menace of McCarthyism. Uh, where we're supposed to be scared of the regs over in the East. Um, but we have grown up in the worst financial crisis since the 30s. We have grown up in an era where income inequality is the worst it's ever been. We've grown up in an era where our wages are stagnant or falling, where health care and child costs, tuition, uh, tuition costs are all rising exponentially, global warming, taking a serious toll on our planet, and we see it, we feel it. We're experiencing the worst refugee crisis in our times in the Middle East. We see the failure of our political system to address a lot of these horrible issues. Um, and so we are ready to reject this system. And we're not, uh, I don't think we're ready to listen to the narrative of it's one race or it's one group of people or it's this particular policy is the reason for these issues, that it is a larger system. And then with the presidential run of Bernie Sanders, saying socialism, saying it in a way that wasn't taboo, but at being very forward with saying he wanted a democratic socialism. It's just creating more conversation. What is socialism? What could socialism look like? And what is capitalism? And how is capitalism contributing to the issues that we want to address so here? So I think without this manufactured fear of socialism that happened in previous decades, along with the clear crisis of capitalism that we're all in now. I think that's why this thing arises in socialism. But the second part of this question, what do you mean by socialism? Uh, as was stated in the introductory statements, there's a lot of different definitions depending on the perspective you're coming from. I think a lot of people right now, a lot of young people especially, they think socialism, they think Bernie Sanders, Bernie socialism. Uh, but there are certainly different ways to look at that. I think for the majority of young people, Though, what they see as socialism is democratic ownership of the means of production, or really just putting people over profit every time without exception. Whereas capitalism is putting profit over people every time without exception. So, um, you know, I agree with this. Uh, you know, young why young young people became excited about this. I think for the reasons that you said that it's the end of McCarthyism. Uh, there's no fear of you know there was no longer the um, this boogeyman, that there was a possibility of having an open discussion about this. Uh, uh, I think the, the question of, this question of democratic socialism, what is socialism, I felt this kind of you know, little 
missed in this. That is, uh, this, this question revolved historically around, in Europe, the social democratic parties became managers of capitalism. That, that happens after World War II. Uh, capitalism is profitable. The example of the Soviet Union has meant you have to, you're going to have to give workers more, as well as the fight that workers made for more in Europe. And the social democratic parties become a model for managing capitalism, and for and then uh, later for managing austerity. But they give they put revolution off the agenda. They're not interested in abolishing capitalism. They're interested in uh, perhaps better health plans. They're never completely inclusive, even though they're very close to completely inclusive in some cases of their society. Uh, but they they don't represent their their social demo democratic model is not a democratic socialist model. And then we had the experience of Stalinism and the experience of communism. And we had the experience of one-party states in some of the biggest countries in the world uh, that were called socialists, uh, the Soviet Union, China, all of the Eastern Bloc, Cuba, uh, Nicaragua for a bit, modeling itself on Cuba really was quite, it was also a one-party state under the Sandinistas. So I think it raises the question that we should be asking is, what is our vision of how socialism will be run if we get, you know, what is the, I agree with Ryan, there is no template for this, but we ought to have a discussion. Do we believe in the one-party state? If not, how do you fight it now as you're creating a socialist movement? How do you not end up either with the dominant social democratic party or with the ruling communist party? I don't want to end up there. I mean, there was a manufactured fear in the United States about a communist under every bed, but communism was a real evil to be fought. Communism was a state that killed tens of millions of people, you know, you have to look at what happened in uh, the Soviet Union, what happened with the starvation of the Ukrainian peasants, what happened with China. These were real evils of communism. So we don't want to go there. We want a democratic socialism. So how do you get there? Uh, are we for a multi-party system? How are you going to have that multi-party system? The Bolsheviks, when they were first elected to power, had a multi-party system. They then gave it up, piece by piece, by 1922, you know, the Civil War and so on. It's gone. Uh, so we don't want the evils of uh, social democracy, we don't want the evils of communism. How are we going to run this society? Uh, there's the idea of workers' power. How do, you, how do you reconcile social ownership with workers' power? Uh, how, do you, how do you create a multi-party society based on people who want socialism? What about the people who don't want socialism? What happens to our conception of democratic rights? I think these are questions that Bernie's socialism certainly doesn't answer, but that we ought to be prepared to answer. And that we are, this ought to be part of our discussion. Where, how do we get out of the socialism that we want that's a genuinely democratic socialism? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm going to skip over the part of the question about uh, why young people are, I think there's already several points, <laughs> the key points that have already been made about why there's a huge interest in socialism. Um, but I think that the question of what socialism, what democratic socialism means, is a really important one Stan's talking about. Uh, and uh, you know, I think what we mean when we're talking about socialism is a society based on uh, on democracy, on solidarity, on human needs, uh, instead of on corporate profits. And it, it, it is, there's a, uh, one basis of it is I think it's different uh, than, uh, and, and it's a, I think an obstacle for, for some people is that we think that ordinary working people uh, can run society. We don't think that the billionaires are the ones, the only ones who have the ability to run society. Uh, and uh, so that's that's actually, that's a departure. I think there's a, a whole section of, of people who want to see fundamental reform, they want to see genuine, want to see real reform, but they don't have confidence that, that ordinary people uh, can, can run society. And, uh, it's, and, and uh, certainly it's going to take a serious struggle, but that's one difference that we have. We, we, we disagree, actually, with that, with the idea that, uh, that, that the capitalists and the billionaires, they're the ones who can run society, and that, that the rest of us can push for improvements within that system. Uh, so what we see is a society that's run where the, the, uh, uh, the big corporations are instead organizations that are run uh, by working people, uh, democratically. So that these big, big corporations uh, actually uh, function on a democratic basis. So we have, we have a bit of democracy in our society, and it was hard won. Uh, there was a, a serious struggle. There was a there, were, uh, there was a, a revolution and uh, civil war and, and the fight uh, you know, for, for democratic rights continued long beyond both of those. Uh, and uh, we have a limited degree of democracy. But what we're talking about is democracy 
in which the real decisions that affect people's day-to-day -day lives uh, are under their democratic control. And so when somebody goes to the workplace, their rights aren't out the window, uh, and, uh, and that, the, that also that health care is a right, uh, which is something that capitalism uh, does, not, does not accept, the capitalists don't accept, and they've been forced to accept it in a few countries, but they're busy fighting uh, to take it away. Uh, we think that, uh, that housing is a human right, uh, and uh, that's also something that capitalists don't accept. Uh, and, uh, and so all of those are, 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 are part of the, of the basic ideas of socialism. And we also think, you know, as I said earlier, that we don't think that, uh, that under capitalism the, the climate crisis is going to be solved, but that's going to require a conscious democratic plan. And we don't think it's enough. We don't think it's enough to pass regulations. We think that we actually have to have our own control over, over these big energy corporations if we're actually going to succeed in, uh, in moving uh, in the direction, you know, rapidly in the direction of ending the climate crisis. So all that requires us to have confidence in our own class, confidence in our own class, that, that we can actually control society uh, in our interests uh, rather than, uh, than following the direction of the billionaire class. And there's, I'm just going to give one concrete example, and I think we'll, we'll come back to the question of the Russian Revolution. And, uh, and, uh, but just one example, so if we accept this idea that well, we can't do that, but we have to fight for what we can within capitalism and, and, and make it a little bit better, then so in Seattle right now, you know, where Chema Sawan is on the city council, uh, we've passed a number of significant reforms, and all of them against the opposition of the Democratic establishment. That started with the $15 minimum wage. We've also now passed, passed taxes on the rich. We divested uh, $3 billion from Wells Fargo during the, the Dakota Access Pipeline fight. Now, a whole series of renters' rights that have, length, that have the, the uh, real estate lobby completely up in arms, and uh, the Chamber of Commerce, and they're absolutely furious, and they're telling the rest of the council, this is too much. Uh, you guys got to stop following, the, you know, letting the socialists, put the socialists on the council push you around, and these people who come to the chamber to push you around. There's been some revealing quotes. One real estate lobbyist said that uh, all these people say the right thing in private. All these other council members, they say the right thing in private, but then when they get out on the, on the dais and there are all these working people who have been mobilized into the city council, then suddenly they lose their nerve and then they, they bow to the pressure from the movement and from the socialists. And that uh, it's Shem uh, Sawant's Red Army that's uh, that's screwing uh, um, <laughs> things up in Seattle. And so but they're responding. They're not just responding with rhetoric. Amazon now is setting the second corporate base. And uh, oh, sorry, I'll cut that quickly. They're setting up the second corporate base. And why are they doing that? Well, you know, we, we haven't had a chance to sit down with them yet. Not that they're going to sit down with us, but <laughs> but, uh, but I, it seems very likely they're doing what Boeing has done. Boeing, they want Amazon wants leverage to be able to say, if you keep doing this, we'll move more and more jobs out of Amazon. And so if that gets to the rub. And I talk about this in terms of, of, of Greece. You know, if we don't actually have democratic control over the economy, if we don't. The billionaires control the economy, and we win even these kind of mild reforms. I mean, 15 is great, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a huge victory. But even if, but, but on the balance of things, that doesn't mean you have health care, that doesn't mean you can afford housing in Seattle. 15 doesn't get your housing in Seattle. And so, but even these small reforms, they are prepared to, uh, to do whatever is necessary. And there are many other examples in history also. Chile, the, the, the government in Chile in, 19, in the early 1970s came to power with the idea of reforming, but not getting rid of capitalism. But that wasn't satisfactory to the capitalist class in Chile. They didn't, they didn't, they, they, that was nice. They appreciated that Allende was saying that, that, uh, that, he, that he wasn't going to go that far. But at the end of the day, they, it was completely unacceptable, even the smaller reforms that he carried out. And they carried out a coup, and they tortured hundreds of thousands of people, and they killed tens of thousands of people, even though there had been no violence from the other side. And so we have to, we have to look at the think this seriously. What, how do we actually win this struggle? I'm already over time. Thank you. Um, thank you for the
uh, really get their degrees and you know face with overwhelming debt um, and and uh, you know issues like this, which we're all very familiar with. Um, I think that the, the main force, though, you know, there's there's always been economic hardship. You know, economic hardship under capitalism, of course, is is, is uh, germane. So it's it's always present. The thing that I think really makes you know why we see this dramatic upswing, why we see this dramatic turn, again, the thing that has always been present also is <laughs> Socialism is a very old idea. It's existed since, you know, uh, a very long time. And, um, you know, so it's not simply a question of, you know, economic hardship or the question of socialists exist and are extended on their ideas. It's a question of that these ideas are being made viable in action. It's a really important uh, contributing factor in uh, the growth of the social movement we're seeing today. Of course, with Bernie Sanders, if you're all very familiar with the first socialist or, you know, see the large social votes and GDP deaths, uh, and the primaries from the Democratic Party. Um, of course, that was that was later followed by a growth of the ESA, the Entire Socialist America, my organization, um, which went from 5,000 members to 28,000 members in the kind of a year. Um, but international events also played a dramatic role. We saw the, the rise of the, the, uh, the Corbyn movement, the, the rallying around the Jeremy Corbyn the Labour Party, um, massive surge of young people uh, and young workers and, and working people generally kind of going in, kind of seeing it as a as a as a pushback against the, the new Labour Blairite faction. And that, that, that was sort of continuing the massive turnaround uh, in the British election, which you know, uh, Theresa May called because she thought this was her chance to destroy the Labour Party once and for all. It backfired on her tremendously. Corbyn's now set to possibly even take uh, the prime ministership in the next election. Um, and of course, the events in Sears as well, as has been pointed out, that played a very uh, prominent role in seeing the Socialist Party come to power, which is something that hadn't happened in a long time in Europe. That was more clear, you know, obviously, the Social Democratic Party was a more clear character. Uh, you know, projected the austerity measures at least in, um, in their program for soft and things like this. Um, and then also, three seconds of time. Uh, <laughs> and then, so I think that the viability of these, of, sorry, of, of their actually being in action in practice, not just in theory, not just, you know, slogans about, you know, socialism, that's always been around, that kind of has always been around, a viable political force is actually able to pose the question of power, which is really the key question. Um, I get people all the time who come asking me, you know, in hush tones, they're like, <laughs> you know, because it's like it's a question that's more pressing on people's minds now as they explore these ideas. You know, everyone knows that socialism is suggested that we know on wage. Socialists could support that. But it isn't that. We can't stop with that. That battle is great socialism. That has to be a much more dramatic change um, in the way that society is arranged, and it has to be clear and viable and concrete. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, second question, which I think has been touched upon, um, so maybe a two-minute uh, limit on, on this particular question, but do you think capitalism can be reformed, or do you think revolution is needed? And let's start on the other end this time. Mm -hmm. uh, can capitalism be reformed, is revolution needed? I think that this, again, is a question that really benefits from being more concrete than I think um, we as socialists sometimes want to. Because again, like, you know, the question of former revolution um, has been around for a century. There was a lesson where her famous pamphlet that was former revolution, I think, a century ago. So this is a question that's been at the forefront of the social movement for a very long time. Uh, unfortunately, we're going to solve it today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, and again, I, I personally honestly question how useful the term for former revolution really are, because there is no revolutionary, there is no revolutionary social organization in the world that has not fought for reforms and supported reforms one or another. Karl Marx even in Capital talked about the need for reform, the need for, you know, how it uh, galvanizes workers, how it increases their power, how it increases their ability to agitate and non clean politically for their interests. Um, every social movement that is, whether they're declared revolutionary or declared reformist, has seen themselves as, uh, in, in practice, pursued some types of reforms or make themselves viable. Um, and again, like reformists, there is, there are no, I don't think there are many organizations that I'm aware of, at least, I don't think there's reformist parties that we don't talk about as reformist parties. Social democracy in Germany or France, these things don't, don't tend to self identify as we're reformists. reformists. Um, they tend to identify themselves as socialists, you know, at least in, historically in the, you know, the, in the uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s, um, and then obviously the, around the time of the Great Depression when the social democratic parties would have an upsurge in power and led to a lot of reforms, you know, a big part of what they were advocating for was a dramatic, uh, you know, 
really a revolution in the way that society went. They saw themselves, those social democratic parties, saw themselves at the time as building an alternative to capitalism. They weren't necessarily saying to themselves, we want to build a nice capitalism. That's something that's more developed now, nowadays in the modern world, you know, as capitalism, you know, the sort of all ends of history as capitalism is the presented itself as like the dominant alternative. So again, I just I just I question how useful these terms are, and I think there's a lot of overlap in terms of um, of what of organizations that consider themselves revolutionary organizations that would typically be characterized as reformists. Um, I think ultimately to answer the question directly, I think ultimately there does need to be a revolutionary change in society. Um, I think we have to move beyond obviously what Bernie Sanders, you know, he ran on the idea of a political revolution. Again, what, what exactly that means in terms of, of policy, you know, is much more similar to the social democrats of the 80s, for instance, in the 1920s. Um, so I think we do need to move much further beyond, you know, uh, simple social democracy or try to emulate social democracy in Europe. And simply, our goal should be a welfare state. Our goal should be um, the end of capitalism. It should be a we should be seeking a permanent establishment of uh, workers' control of, of the economy. And unfortunately for us, a large part of the um, the raw materials for building, you know, a, a democratic planning and things like this is largely there. Corporations don't run. In, corporations run on the planet. Like all these big, massive corporations, they don't run on the free market internally. I think it was the company Sears, um, the president ran, or he, yeah, he was elected to the board and said, we're going to bring free market to our internal structure. He's like, kicked out one of year. He's like, such a massive failure. Um, you know, these corporations largely function on the basis of planning. So a huge amount of the, of the raw materials that we can need in order to have democratic planning at some time or whether there, we have to have a vision to be able to actually see it. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, my question is about the I do think we need a revolution, and I do, I do think it's an important discussion, and I do think that the, the terms are, I think we should be concrete about what we mean when we talk about the form of the revolution. And I don't think it's an either or. Um, I think that, that, that we need both, uh, and uh, but reform in the sense that, um, uh, from our perspective, from socialist alternative perspective, the reform, we fight for every concrete reform that we think makes a real difference to ordinary working people. Uh, and we have a, a, a strong record of doing that. Uh, in uh, helping Seattle become the first major city to pass a $15 minimum wage, but also the things I mentioned earlier, a whole series of victories on housing, including winning $29 million for affordable housing in Seattle, uh, divesting $3 billion from Wells Fargo around during the pipeline battle, um, and uh, um, yeah, a whole series of housing reforms that make a real difference uh, for renters and working people in Seattle. But we don't just fight for them in and of themselves, uh, we fight for them also arguing for the need to go further and for, for more fundamental change and to, to use those that, that struggle for reform to build an ongoing movement and uh, to build the forces of, 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 of the working class and of the socialist movement uh, because we see that as a step towards building a, a broader, more powerful movement that can win more fundamental change. And at the same time, we want to, the experience of fighting for reforms is a huge part of people drawing the conclusion of what the more fundamental change is needed. That when they see, oh, we've won 15, but then they see how, you know, big business in Seattle really wants to take it back. They want to take it back by punching holes in it. You know, they want to take it by undermining the various reforms. They want to they want to attack things like the tax on the rich by by Amazon and other big corporations uh, moving parts of their corporation out of the city. And so the experience of fighting for reform is, is a critical part of people drawing the need that we actually do need uh, revolutionary change uh, if we're going to run society our interests. Yeah, I think that uh, uh, revolutionary change is necessary. The society we live in is appalling in all the ways that have been mentioned in many sessions here. It's exploitation, it's racism, it's sexism, it's uh, imperialism, the, the wars, the climate change. It's appalling. The question about whether or not Capitalism, it's not so much can it be reformed, but even can it reform itself. And I think that um, uh, the, you know, the comment was made, Tom over there, uh, made a, a comment earlier about the, pri the crisis of capitalism. Gar Alperowitz talked about um, that he felt that the crisis can no, the, the system can no longer manage itself. And I, I'm not sure, that is, I, I tend to see this, but I, if I look around and I look at what happened in uh, um, you know, in, in the 1940s, Leon Trotsky is a pretty smart guy. I know a lot of people agree with that. 
Uh, and he predicted the end of World War II will lead to a revolution, an economic crisis and a revolution. Totally wrong. It didn't happen. He did not foresee the stabilization. He thought it would lead to a revolutionary crisis, the fall of the Soviet bureaucracy, and so on. Completely didn't happen. So here's, you know, here's a smart guy who spent his whole life, no more experience about revolution than perhaps anyone on earth, ever, uh, 1905, 1917, the fight against Stalinism, and yet he was wrong. So it seems to me that, and I, and I have to say I've been in different socialist organizations and around others, the International Socialist Organization, in which I have friends and comrades and people I like, uh, and one of its leaders, every few years, gets up and predicts that this is the final crisis and the revolution is coming to mind. <laughs> I've been there for that speech several times. I know the guy comes over and gives me a neck rub like I'm his old friend. Crazy. <laughs> now, uh, if you know the guy, you know what I mean. So uh, that is a, um, uh, I'm leery of this. You know, I look at what happened to Great Britain at the end of, uh, at the end of uh, its period of imperial domination. Great Britain was in a, you know, it's losing its colonies, its economies in crisis, and the Labor Party comes to power, and Great Britain is able to provide reforms. Now, this is an incredibly wealthy and incredibly brilliant bunch of people who are running the world today in the capitalist class, even though I think the working class would do better. I agree with what you said earlier. Working people would do better. But I'm not sure that these people are not going to, you know, well, where do we go from here? They've got gazillions of dollars. They've got, they control everything on Earth. Now, should we have a revolution? Yes. Will we, will we have to be watching for their rival strategies to get out of this, you know, to, to find their way out? Yes. Uh, you know, it's going to be a, I think it's going to be a shifting ground. I, and I do, you know, so I, that, that's, uh, you know, I hope for a revolution. I believe in revolution. I will work for it. And I, but I'm not sure that the capitalist class will not be able to pull the rabbit out of the hat another goddamn time. You know? <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> I'll keep my comments brief. Um, but I think when we're talking about reform and revolution, um, and as far as maybe we should have focused on these terms or, or kind of amorphous what they mean, I think when we're trying to mobilize the larger left, it's important to understand that they are oriented towards reform. That's what people in America and people throughout the world know is reform. And if we keep fighting for reform, then yes, things will get better. But I think as we understand, taking over the capitalist structure doesn't bring about socialism or doesn't bring about liberation. We can't take the institutions of capitalism and control them for progressive movements. Uh, we can't take the multi-industrial complex or our police and somehow use them for the good of working people. Um, capitalists will only give us, as far as reform goes, they'll give us what is allowed to be reformed. Reform is what they allow us to and it really very much provides safety valves for uh, bubbling um, tension that can lead into this perpetual explosive revolution that we also desperately do about. <laughs> uh, so I think as far as us trying to mobilize the larger left, working class people in general, while reform and revolution, the question has been around for uh, many decades, that we need to understand that we should always orient towards revolution
the last uh, session that I was just in, one of the speakers on the panel said that he's always had to fight with Democrats. He never has to fight with Republicans. And I think that's also very telling. Um, you know, the Republican Party, I was never confused as to how they felt about me as a black woman or anyone who looks like me or wasn't part of their class. Part of their class. I always knew that they were only here for rich white men. Um, but the Democrats, man, that took a long time for that message to really come through that they are only uh, the other side of the same coin. Um, and I think people who identify with the Democratic Party or vote for, the, for Democrats time and time again, they have this perceived moral high ground and this comfort that comes with being a part of the Democratic Party. Uh, they're on the right side of things. And so it actually stifles real progressive movements that make real material changes for Democratic people. Um, and so do I think that a new major political party is needed in the United States? Absolutely. Because at the end of the day, the Democrats are a capitalist party, and I don't believe that capitalist nature can be changed or retooled to be effective for progressive movements. Um, and then very quickly, what would that party look like? Uh, that's, that's a big question, and <laughs> I won't go into that too deeply, I'm sure all the other panelists will touch on what that will look like, but I think the biggest thing is no corporate don donorship. You can't have a party who's taking money from capitalists and then expect them to work for us. Uh, the Democratic Party is a very good example of that. Yeah, they, uh, you know, I, I started out as an activist uh, against the Vietnam War and, and have not you know, been an opponent of the Democratic Party since then. The Democratic Party is the party of war. It's the party of imperialism. I mean, uh, the, uh, the Great Depression ends when the United States goes into World War II, and it goes into World War II uh, uh, to, to extend its control and power over the world. Again, it defeats the Nazis, it also defeats England. You know, world War II is the United States victory over England, in large measure the United States over the Middle East, takes over Latin America from England. So, uh, uh, the Democratic Party is the party of capitalism, imperialism, and represents the banks and corporations. Its membership, it doesn't really have a membership, but its voters, its voters are the people that we want to win. So I think that's very important, that we have to understand that. We're, but uh, that, so the, the terrain of struggle, in large part, not only is also the great unregistered people and all the independents, but who vote Democrat. Uh, so that's, that's the terrain of struggle right there. And, and who are our competitors? Our competitors who are our, our political opponents, people that we'll have to work with, but that we want to fight, are moveon.org. Mm -hmm. Indivisible. Our revolution. Those are the groups that are our political competitors for those Democratic Party voters. We will work with them. We will have to work with them because they are involved in all the social movements. And they try to take credit for it. The ones we organize, they try to take credit. And of course, Hillary Clinton says, I'm out there leading the resistance. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, you know, she said that. So, yes, I'm out here, I support the resistance. So, uh, no, that, uh, we have to fight, we have to fight the, these uh, competitors of ours, uh, but we want to fight to win those, those voters who vote for the Democratic Party. And I, the, I think it's true, as you say, especially of sort of, you know, the Democratic Party made a switch uh, under the, the Democratic leadership group of Clinton and so on to orient towards professionals. And I think that for a lot of the professionals, the doctors, the lawyers who became Democrats, they think they have the moral eye. I think a lot of the working class voters think this is the party that is going to fight for me. This is the party that is going to clean, keep me, even if they're not going to do so much hurt, you know, actively they're going to defend me against the Republicans. So I think that we, you know, the question for us is, how can we both work with and critic? This is the idea of the United Front. Another idea from that guy. So if we're going to work in a united front with people, you have to be able to join them in common struggle, but also say, we're here beside you today, but the direction that you want to take things is wrong. We're here beside you today to stand against a white supremacy. But let me tell you, if you want to defeat white supremacy, you're not going to be able to do it through the Democratic Party, not even for these progressive Democrats because they will not be there. They will not stand for that, ultimately. So I, I guess that's my, my uh, yeah, I agree with a lot of the points that you made. I mean, we do need a new party. Uh, and uh, I think it's a party that doesn't take corporate money. And I think that's a starting point. But I think it also has to be one that bases itself on social movement, uh, that uh, acts uh, uh, as a, a, an assistant, uh, 
and uh, that uses its platform to uh, to win games for people uh, by uh, by empowering and mobilizing social movements. I think that's a fundamental difference. If you look at the Democrats over the past period, even um, during the battle over Trump Care, the Democratic Party leadership had won two. It could have it could have organized massive rallies. Uh, it could have been massive protests organized to make it even more difficult for this. Uh,
standing today is perhaps with the of the water. There's a, a massive fight that is still ongoing from the Democratic Party. It was essentially over the soul of the Democratic Party between this new activated Bernie, uh, Bernie base, so to speak, that wants clear socialism, and clear pro work policies. They're you know, not necessarily the kind of socialism that perhaps we would articulate um, you know, among, among the poorest of this panel, but certainly a, a clear rejection of the corporate, you know, dominated, uh, you know, business friendly way of the Democratic Party, best exemplified perhaps by Hillary Clinton. Um, so it will be a complex series of factors, I think, as to how, how this has come about. I do think it will involve some kind of interplay nationally with the Democratic Party, and I think eventually we'll see those forces coalesce, in some cases within, without the Democratic Party, and so it will ultimately break away, uh, leave the Democratic Party a, a husk and a shell, and then you know, more short, put a clear political and economic program for workers. Okay. Um, so we have, this ends at 4.15? Yeah. Uh, so we have about 10 minutes for questions from the audience. So just go ahead and raise your hand. I'm just going to take a, a round of that. Uh, in the two. You guys, uh, and I'm going to have um, the three audience members go ahead and state their questions and then we can have a response to that. And if you could try to look at yourself for about two minutes each. Uh, I am currently reading John Dee's Sending Such as the World, and uh, we have, uh, like, it's towards the beginning, we've heard from people that have talked about the Bolshevik Revolution. So I am interested in hearing your thoughts on the relevance of that, especially since it's the centennial, centennial year of the Russian Revolution. And I'd like to know if you think, you know, we should be drawing some lessons from this. It was a pretty important transformative kind of event. Um, yeah, I agree. I think I'm uh, really glad that the Russian Revolution was raised. I think it was the most important event possibly in human history. And it had reverberations all around the world for the Third World Movement. And it was a, a massive event. The first time and the only time that uh, a real working class is taking power. Um, I think this panel is what is democratic socialism. And I, I think part of the problem I have is uh, I don't know why what, what is the democratic part? I mean, genuine socialism is democratic. I think that it's an abandonment in a way of, of a way to get around with genuine socialism. And um, you know, the Russian Revolution, the uh, party of Lenin, and which Trotsky continued with the left opposition, was dedicated to one first and foremost internationalism. The idea you mentioned socialism in one state, with, you know, socialism in one, in one country was something that was put forward by Stalin. Now, that was never part of what genuine socialism was. You know, the Democratic Socialists of America are thoroughly nationalist party, and they're not a party, too. Right? The other thing that came out of the Bolshevik Revolution, the need for a strong party with principles. You know? Again, something that the Democratic Socialists of America strongly oppose. Uh, you know, and then, I guess, the question of war, which uh, a Democratic Socialists of America entire page on immigration doesn't mention U.S. imperialism once playing the entire thing on economic restructuring. I mean, why is that? And I think that the truth is that it's abandonment of, of genuine socialism. I mean, he was a police chief union organizer in the leadership of the party, of the, I'm sorry, the organization. And what is that? I, you know, so I guess my question is, uh, how do you, where do you get off putting socialists in your name at all? So, I do understand to um, form working class things is very important at this point and to build a sustainable movement in that because what we saw at J20 was something very strong but then it fizzled out. I spoke with a lot of women yesterday and it just felt like they, they are clamoring for something strong, something that would you know, sustain as well. But also an interesting question that came across is that there are so many women of color and so many um, uh, disenfranchised uh, women and, and people in general that work on a minimum wage, that have to work over two jobs to make their ends meet and feed their families. So to these people, how would you suggest that they um, abandon their principles and their jobs and pretty much every resource that is left for their sustainability and be a part of a stronger class of students? How do you, how do you um, propose that they should engage in that? 
but then that, that doesn't last. It doesn't last for uh, reasons that are not principally necessarily the problem of the Bolsheviks, but it becomes the problem of the Bolsheviks that they end up having a one-party state, no longer with the workers running, but with them running the state on behalf of the workers, which they said. The workers are no longer active in their plants. They, you know, the Soviets become non-functional in a couple of years. In a couple of years. The trade unions are abolished. You know, pretty, they're, they're pretty non-functional. They become state institutions that are, there, that are carried down power from above. Within three or four years, the Russian Revolution has been lost, but it takes a few more years for a new class to seize power. And, uh, and I, I would urge you to go read History of the Russian Revolution. Yeah, and read, read my article and see what you think. Uh, but I think that the revolution is, is a very, very important, very brief experience. And it raises this question that we ought to say, we want to build into our future uh, organization. We want to be on, always on guard on behalf of democracy. I, I, I'll, should I take back to my organization a motion from you to abolish the word democracy or socialism from its name? I don't think so. I agree with what Ryan said. DSA, now maybe with 30,000, is a very exciting group. And it's practically, well, founded in the 80s, really founded in the 70s. It's practically a new organization. It's full of 25 or 30,000 young people who want to be socialists and want to figure out what that means. And it's a very exciting place being with people. And the, and the discussion is not organized around a group of us who have the answers. It's organized around a group of us who have the questions. And I would rather be in a group with that, the best question than be in a group I'm suspicious of the group that has the best answers. It's pretty much what you said a minute ago. That is, I think the questions to pose are, how do we, you know, we think workers should run the society. How can that happen? How can that come about? How can we help to make that? Uh, and including the uh, women of color and women who are, uh, my mother, you know, I used this as an example in an earlier session. I don't know if you were there when I said it. My mother was a working class woman. She came divorced, had two kids to raise. You know, our family fell into poverty for a couple of years. She, uh, you know, and it's very, very difficult in that situation. She also had a limited worldview, always loyal to her union. She learned about unions working in a factory when she was 14 years old. Then she was able to, you know, became a grocery checker, loyal member of the retail clerks. I took her to farm worker things with me a few times. She'd say, okay, Danny, let's get a few cans of food and take, take some food out of there. But she was hard to find the space and time. It's a very important question, you know. But I, it means that groups like ours have to find a way. How do we change our character to become hospitable for working class people? And I think it's very, very difficult. I know that Socialist Alternative, and I respect this, has done this to some extent, that Socialist Alternative has been able to incorporate working class people in your organization. I was in an earlier period in the group that we incorporated some working class people, but then it's hard to maintain that their connections to the working class, them to feel at home. These are very difficult challenges. Uh, of a left movement. So I, but I present you questions, not answers. And I think that's actually the way to go. Albert, and then just give you time, we'll have you in the Yeah, I'll try to be brief. Um, so I, I think it's been a really great discussion, and uh, um, it was really good. The DSA and Socialist Alternative we came together to have this, this uh, discussion and debate. Uh, and I think there's two really useful articles. Uh, there's an article from Boxcar Sankara, DSA. Uh, about uh, it's called Finland Station. It was in the New York Times a few months ago, and then there's Socialist Alternative Response to that uh, on socialistalternative.org. You can search on Finland Station on our website to find our response there. And we'll some of these things more deeply than I'm going to be able to do in the next 30 seconds that I have. Uh, but I think it's hugely important, actually, the growth of DSA, now 30,000 members. I think it's an extremely positive thing now that there's an, a, an organ. This is the biggest uh, organization. Uh, Organizing under the banner of socialism since the Black Panthers, and that's a really important development. Um, and, uh, and the questions are really important. I do also think, and I agree with a lot of what Pam said, uh, um, I do also think that we, and I'm not, I'm not saying this, but I think the answers are also critical. And uh, we shouldn't oversimplify the answers because they're, you know, they're, they're complicated. But you know, we have to, we have to, you know, we have to also look at those answers. And I think that. Uh, um, the working class and young people want answers. I mean, right now there's a lot of concern about what's happening, but the question is, what do we do about it? And, you know, in the fight for 15, we had to, the question was, how do we win 15? We needed an answer, and we needed it quickly, <laughs> and uh, because we had a we had a live battle on our hands. And the Bolsheviks faced real, real questions in the Russian Revolution. Uh, you know, you know, how do we how do we deal with the fact that 14 countries are are invading um, the uh, um, are invading and trying to destroy the first worker state? The 
first revolution was the, the, uh, the greatest event in human history so far, and there were enormous gains that were won in the Russian Revolution, and I don't have time to link them. Women won the right to vote. Uh, um, for the, it was the first country, actually, to, uh, uh, to get rid of all anti lgbtq laws. Uh, there were uh, huge, you know, huge gains in literacy, uh, you know, huge gains in, in terms of and all of this was in the context of this massive invasion and the civil war that was sparked by it. Uh, and uh, um, and we, but we have to learn the correct lessons of the Russian Revolution because any success by the working class uh, is going to come under attack. And that's what happened. And so when Tom, I think, uh, was here earlier and spoke uh, last night, talked about where did the violence come from. Well, the violence came from a capitalist class that was freaked out. It was the closest that capitalism ever came. Uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to being over, overthrown, and uh, did actually inspire revolutions around the, around the world. There were revolutionary movements inspired by the Russian Revolution. In fact, in Seattle, right, the Seattle General Strike was inspired by the Russian Revolution, and uh, and so. But uh, uh, the uh, the Bolsheviks actually recognized uh, very clearly that uh, it was not going to be enough. Uh, you could not build socialism in one country in any way. It was not going to be enough to have a re revolution uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in one country, or particularly in a backward country like Russia. And they knew that they would be under attack. And the only way, actually, to build socialism was to spread the revolution to other countries. And there were revolutionary movements for a number of years after, as I said, in uh, Germany and Hungary. Uh, and, uh, um, and they ultimately were defeated. There are lessons to be learned from those as well. But we have to draw the right lessons. Because in fact, there's a lot of there's a, often a point made about well the, the Bolsheviks and democracy. Well, the Bolsheviks, in fact, were the most democratic party that had ever existed up until that point. The Russian Revolution was the most democratic revolution that had ever taken place. The Soviets, uh, which are were, was a word for assemblies, basically, uh, uh, these actually they they debated and they discussed and they voted, and uh, and there was uh, overwhelming support in the Soviets uh, for the revolution and, and for the the October Revolution. Uh, as well, and uh, and and, and uh, ultimately there was a counter revolution, which was going to come unless the revolution was spread. And the counter revolution under Stalin was brutal, uh, and it was brutal in particular because it had to overthrow the gains of the Russian Revolution and had to crush workers' democracy both in the party and in society in order to overturn those gains that had been won by the working class. So that's that is something we have to learn from because every revolution since then has also faced. I mean, you can't look at any revolution where there has not been an attempt to overthrow it by the capitalist class. So if you talk about the Spanish Revolution, or more recently about the Egyptian Revolution. You know, and the Egyptian Revolution is another kind of example uh, where uh, it was a, you know, it was a, an inspiring event that took place, and it had, it had real potential. But the problem was is there wasn't an organization, there wasn't an organization like the Bolshevik Party that could actually uh, take the revolution forward. And instead, what we had happen was a military dictatorship put back in power. There's a lot of lessons here, and I think there's a, there's a lot of really important debate that has to take place about what how can we learn from the lessons of past revolutionary struggles and struggles for reform. And I think that's going to be key in terms of figuring out you know, at this moment in time, because we have to relate to the, class, the, the consciousness of our class where it is. At this moment in time, how do we fight for these reforms and how do we make the case for socialism and what kind of socialism are we fighting for?